so yeah i remember um i arrived with the taxi in marrakesh and um i had my big rucksack on my on my back and another big bag on on the front so i basically had two bags actually with me i i forgot to tell that uh, one in the bag one in the front because i had so much equipment with me and even my laptop and everything and uh, i would yeah i thought i would need all the material for four weeks of traveling and um i ended up in marrakesh at the how do you call the marketplace the big marketplace in marrakesh is uh how do you call it jamal el ifna or something like that i will write it uh, in the screen and yeah i remember standing at this huge marketplace and i remembered uh, that this area looked quite familiar because i don't know if you remember the third movie of indiana jones um he was standing there harrison ford was standing there as well and i thought wait a moment i think i know this place it it it, it looks kind of familiar and i think that was the spot where uh, harrison ford was standing in the, in diana jones in the in this in the third episode and yeah i was so happy to be there uh, standing there and i managed to find a little hotel uh i i i was renting a room there and i remember i just went to the room and i got into the bed and i f fell asleep immediately and i slept through the whole day and the whole night i think i was sleeping for 16 hours straight because um i just came back from the mountains you know and I was so hyped and I was so excited and I didn't really feel how exhausted and tired and fatigued I was. But my body eventually sent the signal that he's very tired and that he needs to rest and regenerate. And this is actually what happened. I, I fell down in the bed and I was sleeping for more than 16 hours straight. I was completely knocked out because my body was so exhausted. I just spent, I don't know how many days up there uh, in the mountains, in the cold snow and ice above 4,000 meters. And I climbed uh, several uh, 4,000ers for the first time in my life. And um, yeah, that uh, didn't go uh, yeah, without um, a reaction of my body and my body needed some time to relax and to regenerate and my body knocked me out immediately and i slept so long the next time a uh, day i woke up completely baffled completely confused what was going on i didn't even know what was going on i lost the feeling for time i didn't know what time it is if it was still in the in the evening if it was the next day i had no clue what was going on i looked at my phone it was the next day early i don't know nine ten ten o'clock in the morning and i thought what the hell i've been sleeping so long i think more than 16 hours and yeah i i I had a great sleep and I was able to rest and regenerate so well. But then I realized, wow, I'm extremely hungry. So um, I left the hotel and I was moving to the marketplace and I found a little restaurant. And yeah, I think I ordered some couscous and I ordered a big glass of freshly squeezed and pressed orange juice and that day um, a routine a ritual was born every time when i come back from the mountains completely exhausted i would drink a fresh glass of fresh pressed juice uh, uh, orange juice and yeah i'm 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 doing this up until today whenever i come back from the mountains one of the first things that I do is when I get back to a town, to a valley, to a restaurant, I order a glass, a big cold glass of fresh squeezed melon, uh, uh, orange juice and I love it so much. And this is what I did in this, uh, at this day. I had my couscous and my glass of orange juice and was sitting there at this uh, Jamal Ifna, at this market, at this huge marketplace in Morocco 
and I was so happy. I was so satisfied because, you know, I was sitting there, had this orange juice, had this great Moroccan food. It was warm. I just came back from the mountains. I was able to accomplish everything I, I was hoping for. I was dreaming, you know, days before. I didn't even know if I was even, even able to climb one of the mountains. I didn't even know if I can afford it, if I can get the cash, get the money to even climb the mountains. Everything was, you know, on the knife's edge. If I can proceed with mountaineering or if I have to turn around and fly back to Germany. And now I was sitting there eating good food, drinking orange juice, having climbed these beautiful mountains in my memories still how I was standing on the top of Tupkal looking down to the mountains to the clouds and yeah it was it was just such a big feeling of satisfaction while I was sitting there in the restaurant and um, yeah I still I still remember this situation this moment very very well and I just enjoyed this moment um, with every every cell of my of my body yeah and I was just sitting there and um, going through all the memories in my mind after I spent I think uh, two days in Marrakesh I was walking through the the city I was mainly at the marketplace uh, exploring the area I th I bought a new belt there I, I went into the depth of the market and I found uh, some kind of leather manufacturer uh, actually a deaf leather manufacturer and you know I look like a Moroccan guy um, all the vendors and, and traders they talk to the uh, to the tourists everyone that looks Western or like white or European you know they they talk to them and they try to sell them stuff you know because they know they are tourists and they can sell them stuff to a to a high price and I was walking around there you know with a with a beard and with my my a little bit darker skin color and looking like a Moroccan guy and I had kind of fucked up clothes you know uh, Came, coming down from the mountains and I, I also looked kind of exhausted uh, not really like a wealthy tourist and everyone ignored me you know it was so great I, w I could walk through the the market and no one really cared for me all the, the, the tourists were annoyed by the, the vendors and traders and I was just walking through the market and had a great time and observing um, yeah what was happening and yeah you know you have to remember i was still very young i think i was at the age of 26 years it was the first time really traveling solo on my own and i just had a great time and i enjoyed it so much until i found this um, deaf uh, leather manufacturer and uh, i asked him if he could craft me two belts and this is what he did even though he wasn't really able to understand me but with pointing and everything I uh, we were able to communicate with each other and he crafted two belts for me that I I owned these belts for such a long time I remember I was wearing them whenever I could I loved these belts and um, yeah I was so happy to find this guy and that he crafted these belts for me and actually many years later I would go to Morocco again and actually I would go to Brahim again many years later uh, and I would spend another night in Brahim's ho uh, hostel and I would climb the Tupkal again and I would go to Marrakesh again and I would find this deaf leather worker again and he would again craft me two new belts because my older uh, my, my older two belts were were damaged and I couldn't wear them anymore but um, I don't know if I will make a video about this story again how I was uh, traveling to Morocco a second time so as I said after two days in Marrakesh um, regenerating uh, filling up my energy reserves getting a lot of sleep in, getting some food. I prepared for the final 4000er, the Jebel Emgun and the Yanti Atlas. I um, looked for a way how to get there. It was on the other side of the mountain range. 
it was very exposed no one was going there and I had the very bold plan and I thought okay you know what I'm gonna take my heavy rucksack and my other bag that I uh, that I had to carry with me and I will go to the Yanti Atlas I will find the happy valley I will climb Jebel Emgun, the last remaining 4000er of Morocco. I will climb completely over the whole mountain range and go as a, well I thought I will ascend from the north and descend on the uh, on the southern side where the uh, Sahara desert is because my plan was to go over the summit uh, over the mountain range and down on the other side uh, where the Sahara is and from there I don't know find the next village and then travel to the Sahara that was my bold plan and I you know I was so filled with confidence and and um, positive energy and optimism you know I just climbed every 4000 in the in the Tukal region and I thought man what is gonna stop me I'm gonna go to the anti atlas and I'm gonna crush it as well that was what I was thinking and yeah, I found a, a, a bus, a coach. Um, it was a very, very long journey through the, 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 the landscape of Morocco to very remote areas, you know, where no tourists are going. Um, I was traveling with the, the, the Moroccans to the Anti-Atlas. I could see the mountain range in the distance already. I was leaving Marrakesh. I remember I after I think maybe after a six or seven hour drive I stepped out of the coach and I asked the guys hey do you know how I can go to Jebel Imgun how can I find the happy valley I had no clue at all I only had the map with me and I could only point to where I wanted to go and people said yeah yeah come here come here and jump into this taxi or jump into this bus and this is how I basically traveled you know I had to completely rely on what the citizens of Morocco told me and I had to rely on that they were honest uh, with me and that they would actually want to help me. Yeah, I stepped off the coach. I just was at some kind of crossroads. Uh, people told me, hey, get into the next taxi. And I, 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 I jumped into the next van. Uh, and then again, I had to wait a few hours, you know, until the taxi or the van fills up. And then that is when they start driving and I kept on driving closer to the anti-atlas. I remember I had a migraine attack during the taxi ride because you know the the road was bumpy and shaky I think um, I don't know I didn't have food poisoning but something bad was going on in my stomach so I didn't really feel well they were listening to horrible Arabic music that was extremely annoying and I felt miserably and horrible until I told the guy hey guys can we stop for a moment I think I need to throw up and actually that's what I ended up what ended up happening I had to throw up and afterwards I, I suddenly felt so much better it was in the middle of the night, I think it was already like 10 p.m. in the night, it was completely dark outside and I didn't really know where I was going. And I remember I asked the taxi driver, hey, uh, just drop me somewhere close to the, the Happy Valley. And if you know some kind of hostel or, I don't know, hotel or anything there, uh, let me know. Please drop me there and... Um, I'll figure out a way from there and in the worst case scenario I still have my tent, I have water, I have food, I have my stove, everything with me. If I cannot find a hotel I can still pitch, up, uh, pitch my tent and spend the night. So yeah, I think I don't know how late it was but it was very very late at, at night. Um, he dropped me at a road and next to the road was a, some kind of a yeah like a long house he dropped me there and he told me, hey, you knock at the door, there's a lady inside and she's managing uh, like like this this hostel and or motel, I don't know what, what you want to call it. And um, I think you can spend the night there. And that's what I did, you know, even though, you know, communication was so hard because you have to imagine the guys, they don't speak English at all. They mostly speak French or Arabic and my French is basically non-existent. I understand a few words and with a mixture of French, English, Arabic words, you know, I was somehow able to communicate with the guys 
and um, yeah, I was standing there at the road next to this house, uh, ho hotel. I was knocking at the door a few times, no one opened. It, you know, it was completely... There was no one there, there were no lights. I was in the middle of nowhere, everything was dark and empty. There was not really a village or at least I couldn't recognize one. And I was out somewhere in the nowhere and I thought, man, where am I here? Luckily, even though I kept on knocking at the door and I think after 20 minutes an older lady opened the door and she was looking at me surprised and asked me what I wanted and I I tried to explain her that I wanted to climb Jebel Imgun, that I want to go to the Happy Valley and that I would need to spend one night at her house, uh, hotel and that I would go the next morning to climb the mountain. And she was having super big eyes. She was extremely surprised because she thought, man, did you look out there? Everything is covered in snow. It's the mid of the winter and it's a crazy winter this year. And you want to climb Jebel Imgun all alone, all by yourself. And I said, yep, that's exactly what I wanted to do because I was overconfident. And uh, she looked at me in surprise and um, yeah, she prepared a dinner for me, prepare, pre prepared a room and yeah i was the only person there obviously there were no tourists no no visitors no one was staying there at all i was the only person there it was only her and her daughter and they prepared everything for me so i could have a rest the next morning her daughter prepared a breakfast for me uh, i had my breakfast and the mother she prepared again like a little care package she saw that i didn't have a lot of money she saw that uh, i did not have a lot of food with me because i said hey can i buy some stuff from you uh, because i i'm running out of stocks and i remember she gave me a huge care package again with a uh, tuna with sardines with coca-cola apples tomatoes um some kind of arabic bread i don't know how you call it in in, in english we say fladenbrot in, in german but i don't know how you say arabic bread um in english so yeah she she prepared a big care package for me and yeah she she demanded that i write my 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 name and my details and my passport number down in the in the guest book in order something is happening so they can start going and looking for me in the mountains and yeah um i prepared everything I, uh, this time I decided not to leave my second big piece of luggage there. No, I decided I will go with my heavy rucksack and my second bag in front of me and I will climb across this mountain, reach the summit and climb down on the Saharan side of Morocco, which was completely stupid, but I was again overconfident because I just was able to celebrate so many successes and I thought what what can even stop me? That was what I was thinking. So I started walking and I remember it was a re completely remote place somewhere in Morocco, somewhere in the mountains. And I started walking towards the Happy Valley or at least where I thought the Happy Valley is. And I started walking and walking and um, yeah, went into the mountains and it got even more remote and even more remote. and until no civilization was was seen anymore, no streets, no nothing. I was completely on my own, somewhere out in the nowhere, in the mountains. And I remember after a few hours of walking, suddenly I came to a little village, but that village was not connected by roads at all. The only way you could reach this little village, it was it was made of clay. It wasn't really a village, you know, with 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 uh, normal houses and stone bricks. No, it was like a like a very ancient village made of clay. And um, I remember I you couldn't reach this place with a car or anything. You could only walk there or maybe with a with a donkey or a mule, you, you could go there or with a horse. But apart from that, there was no way to get there. And I don't know, this was like a little uh, community of, I guess you would call these bear bears. 
uh, you have to know the 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 how do you say the the, the native citizens of North Africa, like in Morocco or Algeria or Tunisia, these are not the Arab Arabic people. The, the native citizens of these countries are the Berber people, like um, more or less mountain and desert um, traveling people, you know, that live there. And these were are actually the native people that live there. And the Arabic culture came there eventually, you know, after the Islam um, happened, Muhammad uh, uh, um, uh, declared the Islam, and then the Arabs moved from Saudi Arabia all the way uh, across the Mediterranean Sea. And that's how the Arabic culture and also the uh, Arabic um, genes, you could say, uh, came into this region, into this area. But the, but the natives there are not Arabic people. The natives there are Berber people. Um, that's, a, that's definitely a difference. And they also, you know, they didn't have the, the, the Arabic language uh, back then. They had their Berber language back then. So I think this was like a little Berber village, you know. And yeah, I remember how I got there. And um, it was just amazing to see this place, you know. It was as if I, as if I traveled back in time and... It felt so surreal, you know, um, to see how these people live there and it was very remote and I thought, wow, how can people even survive here? But um, I kept on walking because I had a goal. I wanted to reach the the summit of Jebel Emgun and I wanted to cover some more distance before I had to pitch my tent. I didn't know maybe I, I can... I, I didn't think that I would be able to reach the summit. I would probably have to pitch my tent before, spend one more night, I don't know, at maybe three and a half thousand meters and then do a final push to the summit. So I kept on walking and walking. So after a while, um, after I left this little Berber village, it got super remote again. And um, I was again completely alone in the mountains. They were just very narrow paths and yeah, no civilization at all anymore. I remember every now and then I saw one or two women carrying sticks on their backs. Um, they were collecting firewood basically and maybe even roots or something or berries. And I was looking at these women and I thought, wow, how can you survive out here? How hard must life be out here? It's probably hard or impossible to, go, to grow crops or vegetables out here. And it's probably even hard to stay warm or feed um, sheep or anything. I thought, wow, this is probably a super, super, super hard way of surviving uh, out here. And yeah, again, I, I saw these women collecting firewood and I thought, wow, what a hard life this is. And I also realized how privileged I was as a Westerner, as a European, um, you know. Um, and I was quite surprised to see how archaic people are still living in some parts of the world. I kept on walking uh, upwards and I remember the higher I got, the more the snow came and um, you know, at the beginning there's just like a little bit of snow and then you know, your feet disappear in the snow and then you are sinking into the snow up until your ankles. I realized I got hungry and you know i had two super heavy bags carrying on my back and the front side i needed to take a little break get some rest but also find some shelter from the wind uh, the wind and i i realized okay i need to eat a, a, a little bit and um, i remember i went into a uh, already collapsed building and i remember i was so afraid to go into the that building I was looking for a little bit of shelter from the wind and the and the cold and I remember I went into this collapsed building and I was afraid I thought man Nordin what is if there's still a person living in this collapsed building or maybe 
there's a dead body or maybe an old man that is just about to die in this old collapsed building you know it was it was a weird atmosphere to be out there and somehow I knew no one can survive out here in these harsh conditions but every now and then I saw traces of civilization and that people actually tried to survive out here and I thought, wow, wow, I'm, I'm so privileged and some people have a very, very, very hard time in life to survive. And I didn't dare to go deeper into this collapsed building. I, stay, I stayed at the front of the collapsed building. I ate a little bit uh, in order to regain some power and to get ready to climb up higher because I saw there's uh, more snow coming up and I knew I would need more, more energy reserves to, to climb up the upcoming um, snow slope. So I was determined, I was confident to climb to the summit of Jebel Emgun and I kept on walking. So I kept on ascending but the snow got steeper and steeper and steeper and eventually it didn't just go into uh, uh, up until uh, my ankles, no even my calves, no even up to my knees. The snow got so deep even higher than my knees and I had to fight very, 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 very hard. And sometimes I even sank as deep as to my hips into the snow. And I had my heavy rucksack with me and this other huge heavy bag with my laptop and all my other equipment, my tent and everything. And I refused to give up, you know. I, I thought, no, I can do it. I, I, I had so many, so much success in the Tupkal region and I can do this. And I was stupid, I kept on fighting my way through the snow and I wanted to keep on and I was fighting my way through the snow, just refusing to give up and I think I spent one or two more hours fighting through the snow, but eventually I had to realize that this is impossible. I was looking up, the weather got even worse, the snow got even steeper and higher, uh, the mountain face got steeper, sorry. and. Eventually, I had to realize, okay, Nordine, maybe this is a little bit too much. Maybe it's impossible to be in this super remote place. You're with both of your heavy bags. Maybe with a light rucksack, this would be possible. But traversing this mountain completely and climbing down the southern side and going to the Sahara, you're, you don't know what you're doing here. You don't know what's going on here. And you don't have the necessary equipment and isolation um, to to spend the night in the ice in the snow or pitch up a tent here in the snow and I thought okay this is too dangerous and maybe maybe I should turn around I hated the fact that I was probably too weak probably too unexperienced too bold and that I had to turn around I was really I think I was considering all the time and I was thinking and evaluating back and forth for about an hour if I should go on or if I should turn around. But eventually I realized, no, it's not possible and I'm probably gonna risk too much if I keep on going. This 4000er would not be able to, or I would not be able to climb this 4000er with this equipment, with this bad of a preparation under these circumstances and that I would have to turn around and maybe try some other day but at this point I cannot keep up with this equipment with this heavy rucksack this heavy bag and I cannot reach the Sahara Desert by traversing over this mountain and that I have to admit defeat and that's what I did after a while I turned around I was walking down the mountain until there was no snow left anymore, until the, the grass was green anymore uh, uh, again. And once I was um, able to leave the, 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 the deep snow behind, I found a nice little green spot, uh, grassy area. And I decided, okay, it's enough for the day. I think it was already like, maybe it was 4 p.m. in the, in the afternoon. I knew that I wouldn't have much more time until uh, sunset and it would be it would get dark and cold outside 
and I decided, okay, I'll pitch my tent, uh, have some dinner, have some food, rest, regenerate, and then go down, turn around, and um, go to the Sahara Desert on another way. But I realized I would not be able to climb Jebel Emgun. I have to admit defeat, and this time I would not be able to climb this 4000 er so yeah, uh, I found a nice spot where I could pitch my tent, I prepared everything and yeah, I found a nice spot and I was happy that I decided to turn around, I prepared my dinner for the day and yeah, I was, nevertheless, I was quite happy, even though I was not happy with the fact that I was defeated by the mountain but I was happy that I was feeling great, that I didn't risk anything and that I had a nice spot, that my tent was ready and that I would have great dinner and then get some great rest and sleep. And yeah, I ate some food. I think I had, I don't know, again, this Arabic bread, some tomatoes, some apples, a can of sardines or tuna and maybe a little bit of cheese as well. And um, yeah. After my dinner, I crawled into my sleeping bag, um, closed the tent and slept through the night and had a great, great rest. The next morning, I kept on walking down the mountain. I came by again by the, the, the Berber village. And after a while, it took a, quite a few hours because I was very, very deep into the mountains. After a while, I, I, I reached the street again um, where the, the taxi driver dropped me a few days earlier and yeah it was again a very 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 remote place I didn't see a village close by and there was just a an empty road out in the nowhere and I saw maybe once an hour a car drove by or a taxi came by and I thought okay I'll just wait here at this road and hope for a taxi coming by later in the day and taking me back to um, yeah to the crossroads where the coach was where it, uh, um, it jumped down, uh, uh, off the coach and maybe I can find a way to get over the mountains to the Sahara Desert. I remember I was sitting there next to the road and I was just waiting there, you know, and I didn't even know if a car would show up or a taxi would show up. But yeah, whenever a car would drive by, I was trying to hitchhike, but no one would take me with them. And uh, I remember a, an old man came to the road as well. And I remember he was wearing some kind of an old suit maybe the best kind of clothes that he possessed and this guy he was extremely skinny I think he was at the age of maybe 60 70 years old he was completely skinny you know I could already see through his clothes that his legs would probably be super thin and also his arms his chest he he almost looked like a skeleton you know like just a bunch of bones with skin this guy had no muscles no fat no nothing and he looked so old and exhausted and i don't know he i don't know how to describe it but he looked like a very, very, very weak and exhausted old man. And I remember I was sitting there, I think I was drinking some water and eating some apples and some bread while I was regenerating and waiting for a taxi or a ride. And I remember he came to me and he, he signaled to me if I could give him some food, if I would um, be willing to share some water and uh, food with him. and. Uh, I remember it was it's such a strange feeling, you know, as a 26 year old guy and an, an elderly or elderly person comes to you. I don't know, this, this guy, he was, 
he looked like he was barely alive, you know, and he was probably, you know, also trying to go back to the city and asking me for, for help, for food and for water, which was a strange feeling, you know. It's a very strange feeling if someone is asking you for food or water, like one of the most basic needs we human beings have, and he was asking me for that. And of course, I didn't hesitate at all um, because everyone... I would I would ha I would have helped him anyways but you know everyone in Morocco was so grateful everyone was so big hearted so helpful everyone didn't even hesitate a minute or a second to help me everyone was giving me either cash or food or water or whatever I needed everyone was helping me without anything in return and so obviously I did the same and when this old guy or old man was asking me for food and water I shared what I had with him I gave him some of my bread I gave him some of the apples and you know I, I, I just received that from a, another Moroccan woman you know so I just shared with what got shared with me you know and um, I also I still had half a bottle of water left and I gave him everything because I knew I would uh, reach a city soon and um, you know the, the 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 food and water is so cheap uh in in morocco compared to our prices in europe or germany and you know with just a a few bucks i would be able to to buy new stuff so i gave him uh, a little bit of what i had and um yeah i i I have to tell this story because um, this is also just one experience or one situation that was burning into my mind and it was so bizarre uh, and you know it it gave me a perspective about how things are in some places of the world you know not every country not every nation is as rich as Germany or as the nations are in Europe no places like Morocco or other places in the world people have to struggle very very hard they are barely surviving they possess almost nothing and they they don't have a, a, a regular job or industry or anything and um, it's a constant struggle for survival you know and um, they are not as privileged as we are and I was a very young guy at that time 26 and um, I knew that the world wasn't like it was in Germany all over um, the place or the rest of the world wouldn't be like it was in Germany. I know that most places of the world were very poor, but I didn't know how poor exactly and um, yeah, this really gave me some insight and showed me how some people on our planet have to actually suffer from day to day, day to day to in order to survive and that was uh, quite an eye-opening moment for me so yeah after the situation i just remember i um, drove back to the next village eventually a taxi came they picked me up uh, I got back to the crossroads, I think, where there were more taxis. I was able to buy some more food. And, um, yeah, I got to the next bigger village. I don't even know what the next bigger village was. And, um, yeah, I found a way. I found a coach that would actually drive me over the atlas mountain the uh, between the high atlas and the anti-atlas and i would find a way over to the sahara desert and um, because i still had a lot of time left i think i only spent like two weeks in morocco and i had three or four weeks of, of time still uh, or in total in morocco so i i knew i would have time left to go visit the Sahara Desert that I never saw before and even go to the Atlantic and um, that was my plan, uh, plan for the remaining days and weeks I had left in Morocco. So, 
seems like the sun disappeared and I don't need the sunglasses anymore. So the remaining days, um, as I told you, I took a coach over to the other side of the mountain range. I was in the southern part of Morocco. I don't know, was it Wazazate? Uh, I just remember that I took the coach to Zagora. So Zagora is like an oasis town, o oasis or desert town. Um, it's more or less one of the last uh, little villages um, before you reach the Sahara Desert in the southern part of Morocco. And yeah, I, I reached the Zagora Desert and I was connecting uh, with uh, some of the Bedouins and I told them that I want to go to the Sahara Desert because that was, um, well, not like a, like a big goal like mountaineering for me, but I was always dreaming of going to the Sahara Desert uh, in my life. You know, at the end I still have Arabic roots and I, I wanted to be in the Sahara Desert so badly. I wanted to see where my roots are or maybe I think you know some of my genes are not just German but also Arabic or maybe even Berber you know I don't know for sure and um, but somehow I felt a, a little bit like a like a desire to be in the desert and to um, explore and experience the desert by myself so yeah I ended up in in Zagora Zagora is a very beautiful oasis town. Um, it's like the last place before the desert where you have water. <clears throat> and I spent a few days in Zagora before I decided to go to the desert. And yeah, um, from Zagora I kept on um, traveling south to the desert. I think I spent three days in the desert. I had too much respect. Um, I didn't dare to go to the desert all by myself and all alone because I thought, okay, um, navigation and orientation in the desert is probably very, very difficult. And I don't, uh, I, I didn't dare to go to the desert alone. So I, I, I connected to some of the Bedouins there and asked, asked them if they would show me the desert. So I went together with them and go to the desert and uh, I remember I met a guy from Australia his name was Bryn I think he was a law student and he was also traveling in Australia at that time and I met him and uh, we were both uh, there in the, in the Sahara Desert and yeah I had a great time there I got to experience how the Bedouins live there and yeah, I got to see the, the sunset uh, in the desert. I got to see a Bedouin camp. I got to see the sunrise. I got to see the amazing sky and the stars in the night of the Sahara Desert. I, I remember I was um, falling asleep on a dune while I was um, looking in the sky and watching the stars. You know, there's no light pollution, no air pollution, and you have just a great vision onto the, the night sky and you can see so many stars and also the, the sunrise and sunset is so beautiful. So yeah, it was just a great time in the Sahara Desert.
After I came back from the Sahara Desert, I decided to climb Jebel Zagora together with Bryn. And um, after I came back from the desert and when I was back in Zagora, I decided to take the coach and travel over to the west, to the Atlantic. I heard that there is a beautiful place uh, south to Agadir that is called Lexira. Uh, Lexira is, they say, like a little surfer paradise. And I remember I went there um, again with the coach close to Agadir. And um, yeah, again, I went to Lexira, to the beach of Lexira, and had a great time there. I, I pitched my tent there. And I think I spent three or four days at the beach of Lexera and just regenerated, relaxed from my mountain ex uh, adventures. I was looking uh, to the Atlantic and uh, spent some time in the tent, was reading my book. As I told you, I was reading Moby Dick. And yeah, I just, you know, spent the, the final days of time I had left in Morocco and uh, yeah, was was spending time in Lexira and enjoying life, enjoying the solitude, being alone, being by myself, connecting with myself, um, re-evaluating what happened in the mountains, what I learned, um, how I developed, thinking about the Sahara Desert, thinking about me, about myself, thinking about my just recently broken relationship, thinking about what I want to do in the future, that I like this traveling thing, that I like this mountaineering stuff, that I want to do more mountaineering, that I want to travel more. And um, yeah, that I enjoy this life of traveling and experiencing, uh, experiencing and other nations, other countries and cultures and being alone on my own with my tent surviving and yeah i was just enjoying this way of traveling i didn't need a hotel i didn't need a super fancy swimming pool or a great buffet with great breakfast every morning no i was happy with my tent sleeping outside um watching the night sky from my tent sleeping in my sleeping bag um, building up my tent and dismantling my tent every day. Um, yeah, I was ha very happy with this way of traveling and I enjoyed it so much and I knew I wanted, I wanted to have more of that and I was already going through my mind how I can design my life in the future to to gather more of these experiences so yeah this is how i spent the remaining days in morocco as i said in the in the sahara desert in lexira i also went to agadir and eventually the time came i knew okay i have to go back to casablanca i have to take or catch the flight back home to germany um yeah so i started traveling back all the way i ended up in marrakesh again and then drove up to casablanca i remember i think i i visited casablanca you know it's also a very historical city i visited the mosque i think i did i watch the was it the champions league finals or was it even uh, a World Cup finals in uh, Casablanca? I don't even remember, but I remember I was sitting there together with the, 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 the citizens of Morocco, of Casablanca, in an in a Arabic cafe, and we were watching football together, and I blended in with the uh, Moroccan culture, and I enjoyed it so much. And yeah, eventually I had to take the plane back, I was flying back to Germany and yeah, I was back in Germany, I think it was the end of December, I think I was just back in time for Christmas, celebrated Christmas together with my family and yeah, I had to go back to work, I had to work again in exhibition and I also had to study for the upcoming exams 
you know, I just spent four weeks in the mountains doing nothing. I didn't learn for my exams. I studied management at that time. So yeah, I had to catch up a lot. But as you saw, I, I chose my priorities. My priorities were not to learn and study for the university, for my management uh, uh, education, but I rather decided to go to the mountains and um, climb 4,000 years to go into the snow, to go to the mountains, to go to the desert, to go to Lake Zira, to the beach, and to wander, uh, to wander around with my tent. That is what I decided to do. So yeah, this is the end of the story of how I climbed my first 4,000er, my first 4,000ers. And yeah, I think uh, I will end the story here and tell you more about how, how I developed, how I ended up climbing 8,000ers or my first 8,000er with, uh, without oxygen in an upcoming video. Thank you so much for your time. Um, talk to you. Bye-bye. Peace out.